Good evening, everyone. Excited to be here. Uh, last time we spoke about the project was actually in the day that we made the first live transaction in Bogota. So I was uh, pretty excited. I didn't know exactly how things uh, would work out, given the chaos of uh, how we, dro we, we, we drove the entire project. But uh, I guess we're more structured to talk about it uh, here. So basically, like Stefan said, we uh, believe uh, Web3 is definitely the future. We don't believe that things will happen from where we are today to where Web3 is today. So there's, it needs to be a bridge. It needs to be a way to connect to both worlds. And we think we have a way to do this. So hopefully uh, we're right. So what's the problem with payments? And I, and I want to give a little bit of a problem perspective because um, we want to make sure that there is a, a business story behind driving excellent tech, uh, which I think Web3 is driving every day of their, their lives. The problem with payments is that even though we're using the iPhone to make a transaction here in uh, Portugal, you're still building on top of very legacy systems. So basically, the ecosystem of payments, it's actually a standard which was developed in 1973. And if I basically even go one step beyond, all of this sits on top of mainframe system, which a lot of you are familiar with, which is a 1969 tech. So actually, just a bit of a funny data, 92 of the 100 banks in the world are still relying on mainframe. And when you say, actually, oh, cool, I can go inside of a cab, not think about my payment. In fact, you have over 10 plus players in the back end connecting pieces of the puzzle to make that happen. So a relationship which used to be a merchant, money in the bank, and a buyer saying, hey, here's the funds for the good that I'm getting. And basically, I went from this model to basically having two banks in between, the issuer bank, the guy that has the, the card, he has a bank relationship, the merchant has a bank to get the funds, and then somebody in between helping this to be connected globally, all the way to this layer, which is schemes, issuers, acquires, the guys that process transaction because the issuer and acquires, they actually said, well, it's too difficult to process. There's lots of new technologies coming. Can a processor do this? And then the processor said, well, it's becoming too difficult. So why don't we bring some aggregators, some PSPs, some gateways, and then the, P <laughs> the gateways, well, it's kind of too difficult. Why don't we bring more and more orchestration layers where Apple is probably connected with in most of the case. So essentially, and I think this is a bit of a uh, overview on it, the front end keeps evolving over time. The back end still st stopped in the 70s. Three-party model became 10 plus party where essentially you have to fund as a user. Everybody in this room sponsor this uh, system. So your hands should be clapping for Visa and MasterCard because they're amazing in creating this business model. And of course, uh, the future of tech is um, evolving to adapt to a legacy system. This is like uh, insane. Now, this might be not in agreement with everybody in the room, but it's the way we see the world. Um, so if you look at uh, from 2008, a real, a new revolutionary, you know, technology, but still with lots of uh, skepticism, where basically, if I actually go into details, you have operational efficiencies, you have enhanced security systems, lots of possibilities for cost savings. I mean, uh, you're talking about transferring data in the most efficient manner, bypassing tons of uh, nonsense systems, and lots of transparency, which in my view, if you actually drive this in the payment ecosystem, it should be like, wow, this is, this is what all of us want. 
but somehow it doesn't work. And I mean, I'll summarize it by saying the crypto community or the blockchain community have been developing things for the blockchain community. And in, in my view, it's missing the component that actually connects to the real world. How can we actually, you know, as I'm not talking about a techie savvy guy that goes in and understands everybody, uh, everything around uh, doing things in his phone and his computer, but my dad, he barely knows how to turn on a computer and we want him to use the payment ecosystem uh, with blockchain. So that's, uh, that, that, that's the, con <laughs> the paradigm I want to I wanna look for it. So the solution should have three principles. So a network which allows um, anyone to basically use it that is powerable, powered and uh, sorry, reliable, efficient and scalable with the back end, no longer depending on the 1970s world. That should be optimal, not rely on banks because again, I want to leave the optionality for users to decide if the financial institutions will protect them or not. Uh, uh, if, if you trust them, perfect. If you don't, perfect. And it should also take the next generation infrastructure and make the entire thing future-proof, secure, and efficient. So those three principles, there's an analogy for it to make it uh, people like me explain easier for other people like me. There was a world back in the days which was the telecom world and there was the VoIP system and everybody thought it was amazing but everybody you know had to go to their computers put a headset and then call somebody else there was a moment in time basically we saw the possibility to do that in our phones and then somebody of course realized why are we actually using landlines or even the mobile lines so all i need is the data then suddenly every call in the world today is via whatsapp telegram Slack, whatever, you choose it. So what we're trying to achieve as Oli is basically saying there's an old world out there connected with 80 million merchants, terminals in place. There's millions and millions of cards, if not billions, actually combi combining all sorts of uh, instruments. And then there's the amazing tech developed by the Web3 uh, community. So if we can actually be the intersection by connecting this world today with instruments which does not require education of users on the act of paying, I want to go tap and walk away. And if we can deliver that experience, very soon people realize why are we paying MasterCard and Visa or the banking industry, all these fees which goes back to us in a format of Merchant fees, right? Because if you charge 10% the merchant, well, congrats, you, user, will pay 10% more for all the goods because the merchant will not pay for it. So we need to make sure the old world capital connects to the new world technology. That should be the goal. And that's how we're going to drive this. And how are we going to get there? We actually put it in four blocks to make this journey not to boil the ocean, but a bit more uh, crystallizable, if you can say that. So off-ramp from DeFi, on-ramp to DeFi, liquidity and user adoption incentives. So where to start? Very clear, off-ramp. So what we did, we basically developed this card. And I was uh, very proud to announce this in Bogota because it was the first real decentralized card in the world. And why is the first really real decentralized card in the world? Is because actually the funds are always in the custodial uh, control of the user. So it is a hardware wallet that basically talks to the Visa application. We well, there is a patent developed by uh, uh, the guys from Tungen, which essentially, instead of just sending the confirmation of the transaction, 
we actually send additional information on the transaction using the railways of Visa MasterCard to then process that transaction on the crypto processing engine and then registering this transaction on the ledger saying, hey, here's $20, you need to pay for it. How many Ethereums should that $20 be? Well, I think one Ethereum per $20 is pretty good deal. <laughs> so, what it means in other words, do applica two applications in this card. One application is the Visa payment application certified, very, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, standardized process. Every issuer in the world knows about this. What they don't understand is the application, which is the hardware wallet component. So the hardware wallet utilizes the terminal cryptography and railways of the schemes to actually do this transaction and help us not to have any other interaction with the user at the moment of transaction. So yes, we tap, if necessary, pin because of the transaction size or ticket size, pin, go. So like your debit card from a bank, if you ask me, my dad knows how to do that. And he still looks in the back of the card, probably for the pin, because he writes on the back of the card, very safe. Uh, but that's, that's, to me, the way we can actually do something in the old world. So this is the VoIP story. So what do we need to build? Right now, we basically did the first part of the story, the card. And it seems very simple, but uh, <laughs> there's lots of ingredients. Uh, and, and, and I mean, noses in combination with Dungeon, in combination with Salt Pay, uh, between licenses, bureaucracy, Visa, MasterCard. Normally, just maybe an example for you guys, just for you to issue a regular Visa debit card, it takes between six to nine months. We did a decentralized Visa card in three months from beginning of the project all the way to the end. So we basically worked in a crazy synergy together. Now, the next component is the terminal, because we believe Visa should be not the means to achieve this, otherwise we're not improving anything. It should be the fallback. So what does that mean? If the terminal is a participant of this payment scheme, then we should basically use the terminal to talk to the new payment network, which in this case starts with Gnosis, later on maybe other uh, uh, ecosystems can adopt. And then we basically have the transaction happening in a similar manner. So we process the transaction here. And that means you're bypassing the cost entirely, making this transaction perhaps a million dollar transaction, if applicable, still costing the same as $10 transaction on the blockchain network. Whereas in payments, produ production cost is minimum 25 base points. So in every $100, at least 25 cents. So we have um, basically the traditional ecosystem. We can basically do this in between. Now, of course, there is still the story around incentives. I haven't found sustainable incentives which can attract the on-ramp story. So on the off-ramp story is pretty straightforward. I've seen some interesting stories here, Diva, Lido. Uh, I mean, we, we can basically, uh, we need your help to build ideas how we're basically going to move people from fiat to crypto. But I don't think that's the point right now. Because the point right now is to make sure this world can continue to evolve. This world will continue to be inefficient, but helping the consumers. Whereas we can always make sure that these guys are helping one another as soon as the value is created. So we need to create the railways, the infrastructure, let the users organically decide what's best for them. It's not up to us. If Skype, well, Skype was the beginning, Skype is no longer the story. 
And, and maybe we will never be the end story, but hopefully we're helping the beginning story with the infrastructure. So what we can do today, after three months of work, we managed to have the card. We can basically talk to any visa terminal in the world, about 80 million terminals. This is basically fluid. Because of Salt Bay, we have access to 50 countries, so we can issue this card in 50 countries. And we have over 300 financial institutions that could issue this card for us. Meaning, we could say that the crypto community can be served, if anything, right? So if you are a DeFi guy, if you have a DeFi funds and you want to spend your funds in anywhere in the globe, we can help you. Don't think that's the ultimate value, but that's the beginning value of the story. So this is the guys behind. These are, very, these are the, actually the guys behind. This is just a funny guy, and this is uh, the guy that basically helps with the partnerships. But um, our objective out of this, I want you guys to basically take two things. One is it's really possible to build a bridge because you have made amazing tech. And, and I think we need to connect more the business problems of today's world into the amazing tech that you already have built. So the moment we put the right team configuration in place in three months, we made sure no double spending was created in the single tap. We made sure that we could issue the visa card, the integrated KYC. We actually maintained existing payment habits. One very interesting thing, a payment transaction can never take longer than five seconds because otherwise the acquirer will flag to the payment schemes, this product is no good. Can you please take out of the ecosystem? It's costing us a lot of money. So for us to get into two seconds, which is essentially where we are today, it required a lot of brains from the Web3 guys, not from the traditional world guys. So you have the brain power to make a hundred times better than what we have. But being confronted with the problem made this actually happen. So we're making crypto transactions in the point of sale. And we are ra rolling out in one week time 2,000 cards to the employees of SaltPay, Gnosis, and uh, Tanjam to test the product to the end of the year, where we expect in the beginning of the year to basically have an end-to-end -end solution for user adopt, uh, 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 adoption outside of our control, meaning start distributing cards to the market. So a crypto native terminal, it will come in a month. We started the specification. We are now using external companies to help us just validating that it's scalable through the payment network. We're creating a uh, incentive model to bring other acquirers to the table because of SaltPay existing customer base and investment base, we can reach 4.2 million terminals. So we believe we can influence a lot the kickoff, uh, spread it in uh, three regions in the globe, very important regions, US, Europe, actually four, US, Europe, uh, South Africa or Africa, and um, uh, Latin America. We still need to do settlement a lot faster. So one funny thing is settlement still seven days. We need to bring down to five seconds. If we do that, we have the fastest settlement platform in payments uh, history, which we think we can do it by January. And of course, we need more liquidity providers because this is going to be a global story. Every place in the globe has its own speed of adoption and therefore you need to have uh, the, the, the backup. And maybe one final thing that I find it super important, interoperability means the ability to use this card and to make sure that this product can function seamlessly without us having to interfere uh, on, on, on the teaching the user, right? So that's the angle we're looking for it and I think we can actually achieve this. So. With that said, that's my story. I'm happy to answer questions, but most importantly, I hope you guys take this story and ping us later. Perhaps you wanna 
contribute directly, perhaps you want to uh, be a partner, you want to join us in this uh, story because you think you can do something uh, uh, more to this, I, it's an open invitation to have you guys. So thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, any questions? Okay, great. Yeah. Marcus, given the volatility of the cryptocurrency uh, compared to the traditional coins of the world, how do we hedge the money to the merchant in the seven days until the settlement? You must be in payments. <laughs> Um, okay, so seven days is not a reality, I think, for a couple of uh, reasons to scale the project. Number one, if you look at uh, the collateral cost for you to say, I'm going to hold funds for seven days, it, you're talking, um, imagine that um, uh, a company that processes about 10 billion, which is not a very large acquire. I'm only going to talk about the acquire side they will need to make a 14 million collateral pot, which is putting 14 million cash into a scroll account, jointly with MasterCard and Visa, where you cannot have access, just to do this 10 billion. If you look in the volumes of crypto, and, and if I look at the, well, in the daily basis, you have 52 billion transactions in crypto between trades of uh, uh, cryptos or, or in between fiat or all volume in total, daily. So if you take 100 million or 500 million out of that, it's 180 million off, 180 billion off transactions. So three and a half days, 14 million, you're talking about 100 million in a scroll account for you to use the payment network. So I think that's the biggest number one problem why it cannot happen. Number two, the volatility is less of a problem. Because if you go into the five seconds settlement, you can basically do this within five seconds. But now, the entire off-ramp strategy relies on stable coins associated with the transaction. So XDAI is a stable coin today. If the user decides he wants to use volatile coins and the ramp off entity decides to accept those volatile, they need to basically settle even to the entity that is holding uh, the transaction, which is the settlement ent uh, entity, either in cash or if they accept in stable coins. So you wouldn't have that issue. Yes. So we have ordered 100,000 cards and they only uh, gave us 22,000, which is more than enough for the pilot, but it took really long to get to Austria card, which is in Austria. Um, I hope, we're still dependent on these guys, but I hope to have it at the next week. So we are not opening outside the group of uh, uh, the, the companies which are behind uh, the project. Just for the sake, we want to test in the card in many ways. We already tested in over 16 countries. It's working. Um, here in Portugal, I got a terminal that it took more than five seconds. When we actually checked the logs, it was basically because of the terminal provider, not because of the card. So there are still things that we need to make sure that it's in place in order for us to go uh, and distribute in the market. And the promise from Stefan, I would still go after him. <laughs> so essentially, the card holds two applications, right? So you have every card use the standard of Yemvico which is the traditional uh, Europay, MasterCard, Visa, and companies. So it's a standard for contact and contactless. And those are basically interoperable standards. This card needs to talk to the terminal and do three things. We call the IAA. Identification, authentication, to then send a request for an authorization. And when this request goes into the issuer bank, which processes, let's call this just a traditional processor, it says, do you have the funds? So card goes into the terminal, hi, hi, who are you? Marcos, identification. Prove that you are you. One, two, three, four, authenticated. Now, then I 
do you have 20, found, uh, 20 pounds for this transaction? Well, let me check. Yes, he does. Response, yes, he does. Give him the goods. Okay, so that's the traditional flow. So what Tanjim did, which is amazing, they understood that why changing this if we can actually add information on the empty fields which are available in this card or in this pack. So Visa basically allow you to put additional information that is specific to your product when you're issuing a card. So you have a set that is a standard set and then there's additional fields that you can fill in with information. So what they did is they use a hardware wallet application, which is the second application, to then validate the user, give you a clearance and sign the transaction, and then put that information in the Visa transaction and say, can you please carry this together with the transaction? Two things. So essentially, and there's many ways, by the way, the payment industry is dealing with this. If the transaction is done with chip and pin, or if the transaction is signed by the user, passwords are individual and not transferable. So if it's a chip and pin transaction, sorry, you did it. That's your fault. So you're taking the, the cost no matter what. Merchant, if you accept a transaction on a digit transaction, not 3DS or uh, any sort of uh, official, sorry, you bear the cost. Now let me give you a funny data. In a million transactions, how many chargebacks do you think is the sample size? Less than 1% is a lot compared. And you're talking about one to two transactions in a million is a chargeback. It's very, very small. And you can basically, by the way, a chargeback can also be considered as a reversal transaction. So you had a transaction, somebody dispute, you do another transaction. So you, you have ways of doing chargeback based on uh, actually just doing another transaction again. But my, my entire point is problems like this seems, it's a very big buzzword. But when you go into the economics of the volumes, I barely look at chargebacks. In fact, inside of SolPay, we have the rule of if it's chip and pin, I don't give a shit. Sorry for my French, or sorry for saying my French. Anyway, <laughs> um, so so and if it's uh, not chip chip pin, yeah, merchant, uh, you fine issuer, you have to pay. So we don't even give the the possibility of dispute. So we went from 20 people in the chargeback operation to one, and hopefully we can eliminate even that one person to do something else, not to go away. So essentially the question is, today you're basically doing this, Visa MasterCard don't care because you're very tiny. The moment you start getting adoption, then they'll be like trying to kill you. There's tons, we, we talk about this almost on a daily basis, and there's many angles to this. This is a huge question. I could spend another hour only in this question, but to make it very simple, the business of the payment schemes is to attract volume. They do not have access to the DeFi volume. So today, they will never see us as a threat, ever. Because there's DeFi volume, they don't have access. How can then they get money out of this story? The moment we can bypass them, I'm not saying that I'm gonna take them out of business. I hopefully, and I, it would be very hypocrite to say that we can because it's, it's very difficult to take these companies out. But I hope that together with the blockchain community, we can reduce the relevance. And if we reduce the relevance, they are forced to change the economics. They're forced to do things differently. And then we all win. So we're in to create a more efficient ecosystem. They will be the means of doing this until we're capable of having them as a fallback, but not to eliminate them. And if the user believes they should continue, they will continue. But maybe we can do a lot of good marketing around the benefits of not using MasterCard and Visa as the means to do something. But that also means the banks will lose their relevance, because our objective is to make every human being a bank, 
rather than uh, making banks centralized entities. If you can control your funds in a wallet without having to worry about this entire difficulty in the tech, what is the difference for you if you open an app that is all your funds there, and if you open another app, which your funds is there, are, are there? So if it's the same user experience, you shouldn't care. And I think our job is to make sure that it looks and feels exactly the same. And you choose if you want to leave a bank behind you or not. So to, today we're doing um, hopefully a decent first version. So basically you take the card. If I have a, a sexy assistant, please on stage. <laughs> So, what I do? if you can hold the microphone, oh. thank you. Um, all right, so we go here. Oops, let me close it, sorry. So, we have the app. Click on, read the card. I cannot see it. Wait. <laughs> yeah, here, access code. No, that's my PIN code. Access code is basically your access to the wallet, so it can be a phrase, it can be a uh, hundred uh, digit, it doesn't really matter. Mine is a very difficult one called Hi Marcos. Continue. It's a hardware wallet, so it needs to validate. Validate it. It shows the cards and the funds. Now, if you want to make sure that you can uh, top up, ideally, and this is what we're bringing now uh, already for the salt pay users, fill in your wallet with uh, cash. So you click, and then you can just on-ramp. Fiat. Fiat to crypto. That's the idea. So you have an on and off-ramp in this wallet. So, like I said in the beginning, what we're interested right now and we have, if I go back in the presentation, this is where we are right now, tech. Can we do this in the speed that is required by the standards of the payment ecosystem so we don't get issues with MasterCard and Visa, first of all, then the acquires and the issuers, then the gateways, then the aggregators and the PSPs, and so on and so forth. Can we actually please that side of the world where they just look at it, they don't say it's risky, there is dodgy money, uh, this transaction takes too long. So we solve all that, those issues by basically saying it's just another fiat transaction in your eyes, but in fact it's not. That, done. Then this story on ramp. This story, there's first of all the complexity on the liquidity, there is the complexity on tech, the wallet. Is this the best wallet? Can we actually bring in Argent or other wallets to this ecosystem? So they basically have better user experience, because here is not really a good user experience. I mean, you have to do three, two tabs and there's a bunch of things that we can get rid of as we go. By the way, our KYC process is terrible right now in terms of uh, we are, we're not using native in the app, we're using another window that validates, so it, this is not, but this is not the case for what we want to achieve at this stage. But this needs to be in place. Once this is in place, then we have the incentives. We can only talk about the regular 99.99 .99 people the moment incentives are in place. And I don't think it's our job to do that. Uh, my, 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 my dream is to build the railways, the connection between one world and another. If I look at Diva, Lido, and many others, there are so many people doing great things that will add value to the user. I'll just make sure that I can connect those stories and let the system grow uh, organically. So we will, by the way, so not to be totally uh, uh, away from the question, we are building a unit that is only looking at incentives. So we can accelerate from what technology 
is already built on the Web3, how the old world would put money. For instance, one of the things that we talk very frequently is the ventures or uh, bonds being traded, and then we can collateralize them, tokenize, provide credit. I think there's tons of mechanisms to bring incentive, but at the end of the day, if you read the book from Visa, which I, list, <laughs> I, I, I listened recently, uh, one to many, they started with credit. That's how they basically scaled Visa all over. So we need to do something very similar as a community if we want to bring the regular user base. But the regular user base will only come if it feels exactly the same as opening a Monzo account, a Revolut account, and, 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 and even funnier because it's going to be like that but no financial institution. So there's no 0800 or 1800 phone number for you to call it and say, why is it taking three days? So, 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 so that's the, the story. But we are not in that, uh, it's, it, we're not in that phase. We're not talking about incentives. There's nothing to motivate people for yet. Thank you guys.